Good afternoon. Wonderful to see Missouri Auditorium full for a historic moment where a sitting director of the National Science Foundation is here at NIH to talk about his own research as a scientist who has worked at the interface uh, between engineering, biology, and applied that uh, in ways that I know you're going to find uh, to be of considerable interest. Just wanted to read you a brief paragraph about the responsibility of an engineer. This was written some time ago, not by uh, today's speaker, uh, but I thought it would be a particularly appropriate way to introduce him. The writer here in 1937 writes, to be an engineer in these days is to bear a proud title, to be able and willing to speak true opinions on the complex technical affairs of the day without prejudice and free from control is a privilege that is becoming rare in the world. Insistent upon his prerogatives, kowtowing to no man, respected because he speaks a truth the country needs to know. The independent engineer stands as an important member of the professional class, a strong bulwark against disaster which can guide our steps into the ways of pleasantness and into the paths of peace. What a wonderful description of an engineer of the sort that you're about to hear from, uh, Dr. Subra Suresh. Who wrote those words? Vannevar Bush, who about 10 years later became the major architect of the way in which the government of the United States funds research in science, including the National Science Foundation and, yes, the National Institutes of Health. Subra Suresh, our speaker, is a distinguished engineer and now director of the National Science Foundation. And he is on leave as the Vannevar Bush Professor of Engineering at MIT. So there's a connection here in case you were wondering. Um, he received his undergraduate degree from the India Institute of Technology in Madras. Uh, a master's degree in mechanical engineering from Iowa State, and a doctoral degree in mechanical engineering from MIT. After postdoctoral training at UC Berkeley and the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, uh, he joined the faculty of engineering at Brown University, but has been uh, at, since that time at MIT until his recent appointment as the NSF uh, director. He's the recipient of a large number of awards, including the Acta Materialia Gold Medal, which is a very big deal in engineering, and is the author of more than 240 research articles. And I understand he's also a long-term NIH grantee. And the work that you are going to hear him describe at the interface of engineering and biology focused on a number of areas, but particularly malaria, is work that's highly relevant uh, to many of us here today. So I've enjoyed very much the opportunity to work with Subra since he and I both came to these current positions. It's critical for NIH and NSF to seek out ways to collaborate, uh, to work on projects that cross lines between disciplines, cross between basic and applied. And it is a great personal pleasure uh, to have him here today. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Subra Suresh. Thank you, Francis, for your kind introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's somewhat intimidating for an engineer and uh, somebody trained primarily in physical science to come out to of all places to the National Institutes of Health and talk about human diseases. But uh, um, I, I very much welcome the opportunity. And I've had the pleasure of working with a number of people from NIH uh, so I'm uh, really grateful to have the opportunity to be here. I want to set the scene for how um, I got involved in this work. Uh, it's been nearly 10 years uh, since we started with this work. My background is primarily in engineering, mechanical engineering. And over time, I migrated to material science. And when the National Nanotechnology Initiative started uh, in the late 90s, uh, I was in charge of one of the a big nanoscience centers uh, at MIT. And it, this entry into biological sciences and bioengineering, and eventually at the, uh, into human diseases, started at that point where one of my biology, distinguished biology colleagues at MIT who came to a 
lab that I opened said, you should stop working in dead materials and work with materials that are alive. And uh, then we did some experiments. And I went to visit with him. And if I mentioned his name, all of you will know him. Um, he said, well, it's all well and good, but it's all physics and biology working together. If you want to really excite me, you have to look at human diseases. So that got me thinking about the next step in this work. So that's why I'm here. Now, what I'm going to talk about at the intersections of engineering, physical sciences, and life sciences is nothing new. People have done this for a long period of time. So this is not something that's new. And most of you know that extremely well, better than I do. But here are the interesting things. The pumping of the human heart, the fluid mechanics of blood flow through arteries and veins, the contact mechanics of articulating surfaces, the tribology um, of uh, contacting surfaces. These are all engineering problems. Or if you go to something like traumatic brain injury, the, the mechanics of how a stress pulse hits the human brain from some distance, depending on the size of the explosives, that's an engineering problem. All of this has been very well established, and bioimaging, uh, uh, resonance, uh, magnetic resonance imaging, and so forth. There is a lot of engineering that goes into it. So none of this is relatively new. But what is new in the last five to 10 years is going from the system level to the organ level. We can now go to the cell level and molecular level and the single DNA level with a force resolution of a pico-newton. And I want to remind you, pico is 10 to the minus 12. Uh, a displacement resolution of an angstrom uh, that's something new. We can do that in a desktop instrument. So we can look at the intersection of biology, engineering, physical sciences, and medicine with a scope, reach, resolution that we could not have done five years ago. That combined with the revolution in genomics and genetics gives us an opportunity to target a single protein in the context of a human disease and ask questions that we may have never asked before. Add to that the revolution that has taken place in computational hardware and software over the last 10 to 20 years, none of this would be possible at the scale at which I'm describing today without computational modeling and simulation. And that's extremely critical. And uh, so experiments can only be interpreted through modeling, and experiments can only be guided through modeling and design of experiments. So all of this is coming together at a time where we can address human diseases with an unusually different perspective. The same colleague with whom I had the conversation also said, remember, biologists think that human diseases, everything has to do with human diseases, has to do with biology. Chemists think it's all chemistry. Geneticists think it's all geneticists. I don't want you to think it's all engineering. So I, I'm painfully mindful of that very powerful statement. So hopefully, I'll try to convince you in the next uh, 45 minutes or so that it is at the intersections of these very different disciplines that the biggest advances are likely to be made, and not with any one single perspective. So I would hopefully walk you through uh, a sampling of these intersections from very different fields. Uh, because the broad audience is very broad, and I'm going to deal primarily at a fairly high altitude without getting into nitty gritty details. Fortunately, everything I'm talking about today is in the published literature that we have published in the last uh, five to eight years. And uh, so there are many greater details. If there are questions on specific details, we can try to address them uh, offline. I also will be remiss if I don't point out that the bulk of what I'm going to present is funded by the National Institutes of Health. Uh, we had some other funding sources. Uh, this is NSF is not one of them. And uh, <laughs> Uh, not, not because uh, it, uh, they didn't want to fund, because I didn't try at that time because of the nature of this work. Uh, National Institute of General Medical Sciences and uh, Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, uh, those are the two uh, sources of funding, plus other sources of funding, both domestic and abroad. And more to, most of what I'm going to deal with is at the scientific level today. This, this work has also led to about uh, 10 or 12 patents during the course of the last uh, uh, seven to eight years. But I'm going to put a scientific flavor rather than a, an applied flavor to this talk. So let me start with a motivation, uh, which I already described, but just to bring home the point. I'm going to ask a particular question, 
and which is a very simple question. In the context of human diseases, you pick any major disease class that you like, and you ask the following question. How are human disease states influenced by cell and molecular level changes in physical properties? Physical properties could be elasticity, viscoelasticity, contact, whatever it is, um, or vice versa. And obviously, we want to do the experiments first. Uh, I'm, I come primarily from an experimental field, so I don't believe in computations unless I, it's backed by experiments and validated by experiments. So we ask the question, uh, in a given disease state, at the cell level, if you go from a completely healthy state to a completely pathological state, what, about, what are the systematic changes, uh, progressive changes, in the biophysical properties at the cell and molecular level, subcellular level? Um, um, or if these properties arise because of an infectious disease from a vector, from a, a medium external to the human body, uh, it may arise because of chemistry or pollution, or it may be a hereditary factor. So we looked at all of them. Or something where you don't know the origin, like different types of cancer. So I'll end with one particular example of a particular type of cancer uh, to point out the intersections of physical sciences. And uh, in that particular case, it's uh, therapeutics. Uh, so, so that's essentially the overriding question. And we also want to pick a system where in vitro we can go from a completely healthy to completely pathological state in a controlled manner in a reasonable period of time. And that's important to do controlled experiments. So that's the first question. Then the second question is, how do we tap into the latest advances in very different fields that may not have talked to one another in a systematic, coordinated way? Different branches of engineering, uh, biology, biochemistry, all the advances that have been made in genetics, uh, of course, com computation and imaging. Of course, ultimately, all of this will be successful only if we are able to do multi-scale, go from the molecular level to the system level. And of course, that's a very challenging thing to do, either experimentally or computationally. So I'll show a couple of examples of our attempts in trying to address that particular question. So I'm going to focus on three different scenarios, examples. Uh, Plasmodium falciparum malaria, and I'll tell you in a minute why we picked it, uh, going from mechanical engineering to microbiology and parasitology. Uh, hereditary, different types of hereditary blood disorders. And also, I'll just end with one example of a particular type of cancer. The reason we picked Plasmodium falciparum malaria is A, because it's a problem of major global uh, health concern with, uh, according to WHO last year, as you know, approximately 700,000 um, people died from malaria, mostly children uh, from um, uh, develop developing countries. Uh, but more from a scientific perspective, um, the Plasmodium falciparum parasite, uh, you can culture in vitro. Uh, in 48 hours, you can go from a completely healthy carrier of that in the human body, the human red blood cell, to a completely destroyed state of the red blood cell in 48 hours. And that's directly connected with clinical symptoms of febrile episodes uh, for uh, P. falciparum malaria. That's one of the reasons, but there are many other reasons. For example, the red blood cell is nice and round. It's axis symmetric. If you're an engineer, it's easy to model. It has no nucleus, all kinds of things. Viscoelasticity of the membrane is very well known. There are lots of compelling reasons in addition to the human tragedy of malaria. Uh, that we, why we looked at it from a scientific point of view. So again, I'm, uh, I want to start with the first part of the talk, uh, physics meets cell biology. So all of this involves collaborations with very different communities. So we started with a spectroscopy lab in the physics department at MIT. And um, so this is the first, uh, and why physics, or why engineering, uh, the, the, the distinction between Physics and engineering is blurred. Sometimes many physicists feel is that engineering is a subset of physics, so uh, we'll, we'll start with physics. Um, again, uh, most of our blood is red blood cell. And from, a, from the point of view of this particular work and this particular talk, if you look at the geometry of the healthy human red blood cell, a discocyte, approximately 8 micrometers in the long diameter and 2 micrometers in the short diameter, when the blood cell navigates through the human body during the course of its 120 days, it has, its main function is to deliver oxygen and carbon dioxide. 
in the, and take the carbon dioxide back to the lungs. And if we take a small blood vessel in our brain, the inner opening may be of the order of two to three micrometers. So an eight micrometer disc has to squeeze through a two micrometer flexible tube to do its biological and chemical function while it's flowing through and billions of these red blood cells in the human body, that's where in mechanical engineering comes in. That means it has to stretch, and this is what engineers call neo-Hookean response, or large reversible elastic deformation. And the red blood cell has to do it millions of times during the course of its 120-day life in the human body. And, and billions of red blood cells have to repeatedly do it. So immediately, without knowing anything about biophysical properties, you can appreciate if the cell loses its ability to stretch, you immediately get a disease. Or if you get a disease, that may compromise the ability of the cell to, to stretch and therefore do its biological function. So that means, how do we probe it? And this is, again, not, not new. People have looked at it for, for 20, 30 years using things like micropipette aspiration and other kinds of tools. The problem with those kinds of traditional tools is that you cannot probe the complete range of alterations in biophysical properties in response to either chemistry or external medium or genetics using the level of precision and accuracy that you need to understand fundamentally and scientifically what the problem is. And that's where nanotechnology comes in. If you go to a disease like Plasmodium falciparum malaria, this is a, a paper written out of uh, an NIH um, uh, scientist. Uh, Lou Miller and co-workers. Um, essentially, the, the female Anopheles mosquito, when they feed on the human blood for protein, when the sporozoites go to the human liver, the liver produces merozoites and sends them into the bloodstream. The merozoites target the human red blood cell. When they get inside the red blood cell, it starts a 48-hour so-called asexual cycle, during which time three things happen. The proteins are transported from the parasite to the cell, uh, to the hemoglobin and to the, uh, the spectral network of the red blood cell. That causes three effects. One is the cell becomes very stiff during the course of the 48 hours. It becomes very sticky. There is incre increased cytoadherence. And the third is that the s a single parasite can divide and multiply up to many parasites during the course of the 48 hours. At the end of the 48 hours, the cell ruptures spills the parasites into the bloodstream, that coincides with the increase in body temperature as body fights it. So that's a clinical sim symptom that follows it immediately. So these effects are primarily mechanical in nature, not according to engineers, but according to microbiologists. And this has been in the literature. Uh, for example, the increase in stiffness using conventional tools was thought to be a few times, but as I will demonstrate in the next few slides, if you do advanced tools, it's actually many more than, much more than three times. It's, it can be up to 50 times. And you can probe it over the entire course, including the cytoadherence stage, with a level of sophistication that you cannot do otherwise, which can, which can even inform current clinical practices uh, for, for uh, this particular type of disease. Same with cytoadherence with tools like um, um, uh, atomic force microscope and other, other techniques. So the first experiment that I want to demonstrate involves something called um, uh, laser tweezers or optical tweezers. And here are the challenges from an experimental point of view. If you want to completely probe the entire stress state of a single live human red blood cell in a phosphate buffered saline solution, you need a force resolution of one piconewton. So the force is pico, the displacement is micro. Okay, that's six orders of magnitude difference. So if you average, it's nano. So that's why I call it nanotechnology. Now, so if you take the top row, it's a healthy human red blood cell. On your top left, it's a healthy human red blood cell. You have two high refractive index glass beads that are attached functionally uh, tethered to diametrically opposite ends of the red blood cell. So this is a technique for which Sec Energy Secretary Steve Chu won the Nobel Prize in 1997. And um, he was one of, the, one of the people who shared the Nobel Prize for this. So the way you do this, is you use the glass beads. You shine the laser beam not on the cell, but on the glass bead. So you attach the beads tightly to the cell. You can either trap both the beads with a laser beam, or you can trap one of them and attach the other one to a glass slide. 
Now, the optical trapping means that I, if, depending on the, uh, the laser power, the diameter of the bead, the refractive index of the bead, you trap the bead so that if you move the laser beam, the bead will move with it. So it's like a handle, which is tightly attached with a force resolution of one piconewton. Okay. Now, the standard calibration for this technique has been known in mechanical engineering for 60 years. Uh, it's, it's something called Stokes Law. And uh, that's how you calibrate it uh, for this. So now you have a flexibility to do an experiment at a piconewton level with a single human red blood cell, and you can probe every state. So you can go from a healthy state as a merozoid invades the human red blood cell to after to the near end of the Shizon stage of the maturation of the erythrocyte inside the RBC, in, inside the, the, the maturation of the merozoid inside the erythrocyte. Um, you actually have um, uh, a very precise tool. So that's the top row is a healthy red blood cell. You can see the middle picture in the top row shows a control force of 68 plus or minus 10 piconewtons. The top right figure shows 151 piconewtons. And uh, that's a very controlled X plus or minus 15 piconewtons. The bottom row, you have the red blood cell, healthy red blood cell. Now this is the plasmodium falciparum merozoid. Same experiment at the same force. You can see that the cell has lost its ability to stretch. And this was in the Shizon stage after about 30 hours or 30 to 36 hours of the parasite being inside the cell. And until this work, which is the work of my graduate student, John Mills, it was felt, it was believed in the literature that the extent of stiffening was of the order of three to four times. So if you do these experiments at this, with this uh, level of precision, you find that it can be up to 50 times. And that's a huge difference in, uh, in, the, in the influence. So now let's go to, so that's the first point. It's a static experiment. It's not realistic. So, but just to demonstrate the biophysical property. Now let's go to the second point, uh, still staying with physics. One of the things that's been known for more than 100 years is all living erythrocytes flicker or fluctuate. So they are chemically active, they are mechanically active, um, they, can, they, have the, they have the propensity to sense electrical activity in the surrounding media. So given all of this and the continuous remodeling of this spectrum network, it's been known that cell membranes flicker. But how much they flicker has eluded experimental observations for almost a century. About 10, 12 years ago, a group in Munich, Sackman and co-workers, studied the edges, the periphery of the human red blood cell and found that there is significant effect of flickering that they documented, but they thought that ATP played a big role in modulating the extent of flickering. Then a group at the New York Blood Center, about five, six years ago, around the time we were doing this work, they also did the experiment, but they did in the middle of the cell, they found flickering, but they said there is absolutely no effect of ATP. So two reputable groups doing two well-established methods come to diametrically opposite conclusions. The question is, how can both of them be right, or if, if not, who's wrong? Part of the problem has been you could never do a full field experiment. So we decided to fix it using a technique that's known in physics for many decades, but never been applied to biology. So this is the collaboration at the Harrison Spectroscopy Lab at MIT with my late colleague, uh, Professor Michael Feld, and our joint student, uh, uh, Young Kyun Park, who's now at the faculty at the KAIST in South Korea. So this is uh, his, uh, his paper that describes the membrane flickering and the role of ATP in modulating membrane flickering. The, the, the advantage of the technique are the following. So here, it's, I'm just going to give a one minute description I'm reminded that uh, there is a rule in seminar giving, after lunch, only one equation is allowed. So <laughs> this is my only equation. Um, so here is the experiment, very simple concept. So you take a red blood cell in a PBS solution. You send a plane wave, a laser beam, through this. The refractive index inside the cell of the hemoglobin is different from the refractive index in the surrounding medium. The change in refractive index causes something called a phase shift, which in this equation is captured by this symbol delta phi as a function of space, x, y, which is in plane, and z is in this direction. So the, the plane wave undergoes a phase shift. So if you know the wavelength of light, which we know in this case from the laser beam, if you know 
the difference in refractive index delta n between inside and outside, which we know, and if you know the phase shift, which we know from the fringes that come out of this, then you know everything to, you need to know to capture the fluctuation. And the interesting thing is you can measure the fluctuation with a spatial resolution of a nanometer and a temporal resolution of a millisecond. Full field, non-contact, problem solved. So that's exactly what it is. So now let's look at what it looks like. First I'm going to show you a video of a healthy red blood cell. Then we will go to the early stage of plasmodium falciparum inside the red blood cell, which is the ring stage, then the trophocyte stage, then the schizon stage, and you'll see the difference. First we'll start with a healthy human red blood cell, nanometer level fluctuation. And that's the time step in milliseconds. You can see how uniform the fluctuation is for the RBC. Now we go to about 10, 12 hours after the parasite got into the red blood cell. Still it flickers, but uh, it's much less. The later stages, this is what happens. So the cell loses its ability to flicker. It also loses its ability to deform. So uh, clumping of parasites contributed by cytoadherence, loss of deformability, not only affects the ability of the invaded red blood cells and uh, healthy red blood cells attached to them to navigate through microvasculature, it also can compromise the ability of the spleen uh, to do its job by taking the parasite out of the red blood cell. So, so this demonstrates the role of um, uh, physics in being able to quantify cell flickering. Now let's look at the chemistry effect of ATP. So we have a healthy red blood cell. So this is root mean square displacement in nanometers. This is a healthy red blood cell. These are the p-values for the various experimental combinations. This is taking ATP out in two different ways, irreversibly taking it out or metabolically taking it out, and then reintroducing ATP so that you can show that you can go back in a reversible manner in some cases. So what you find is that ATP plays a very critical role in modulating membrane fluctuations. So the connection between physics, mechanics, elasticity, and chemistry and the other thing you find in this is, so if you look at the entire cell, at the edge of the cell, you get a different response with respect to ATP than in the center of the cell. So both the groups that previously employed very different tools to look at only a portion got it right, but they didn't look at the entire picture. So when you look at the entire picture, you see the consistency of, the, uh, consistency of this pattern. So the next question is why, and can we probe a little bit further? So when we try to do that, you find that you get these peaks in these experiments, in the membrane fluctuation experiments, in the spectroscopy measurements. Each of the peaks corresponds to a, is separated by a particular distance. That distance coincides exactly with the geometry of the spectral network and how different proteins are tethered to the spectral network. When proteins debond or disconnect, each of that is connected with the way in which membrane fluctuation is affected, and that disconnect arises primarily because of the way in which ATP interacts with the spectral network. So there is a clear connection between the geometry, the structure, the molecular structure, and the chemistry, and you see that in the spectroscopy measurements as well for the four cases that I just described. So next, let's go one level further deeper. How do we bring genetics with one protein and try to see what is the effect of one particular antigen in modulating physical properties. So the Plasmodium falciparum uh, genetic code was deciphered around two, early 2000s, around the time NIH did all this work. And I happened to be fortunate enough to spend a sabbatical at Institut Pasteur in Paris. Uh, during that time, uh, one of the PhD students at Pasteur had figured out not only how to knock out a particular gene that was suspected to be responsible for uh, the modulating physical properties, but also knock it back in. So we can do controlled experiments with revertent uh, proteins. So what I want to demonstrate in the next series of experiments, it's also an interesting challenge in international collaboration. The gene knockout was done in Paris. It was shipped to Harvard School of Public Health, and then from there it got to MIT to my lab, and that's where the mechanical experiments were done. Coordinating all of that was as hard as understanding the science behind it. 
So let me take a minute to carefully describe uh, what the experiment is. So the, based on the field work that Pasteur had done in different parts of the world, the protein that was suspected was called RISA, ring-infected erythrocyte surface antigen, which primarily affects the early stage of maturation of the merozoite inside the erythrocyte, the RISA protein. So we wanted to do a targeted single protein nanomechanics experiment at the piconewton level. So the top figure is a triple immunofluorescent optical micrograph, which is color coded for three, three entities. The RISA protein is color coded green. So where all the red blood cells are color coded for band three. So whenever there is a healthy red blood cell that shows up under the microscope as color red. Whenever there is a parasite, it's either purple or blue. You can see the parasite here, 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 etc. So whenever a parasite gets inside a red blood cell, the parasite transports the RISA protein to the host cell. The cell turns green because it now receives the RISA protein. So, so that's the wild type experiment. Now we take the parasite, clone it, knock out the RISA protein, culture it, do the same experiment. And you have the red for band three, you have the purple for the parasite. But RISA has been intentionally knocked out, so there is no green here. So all this proves successfully is that we've successfully knocked out the RISA protein. We can, of course, introduce RISA protein, and you'll get the green color back. So that's essentially the experiment. Now we do our optical tweezers experiment, first the static experiment. When you do that experiment, this is what you find. First at body temperature, second at the febrile condition, because this is the most one of the relevant conditions as well. So you have the healthy RBC. You have the RISA plus, the wild type, and the RISA knockout here at a normal physiological temperature, and then the febrile condition. And what you find is that just the RISA protein alone, even in the very early stages of maturation inside the erythrocyte, significantly stiffens, in this case by a factor of three, the host red blood cell. When you knock out RISA, the stiffness goes down. But the extent of stiffening and the response of the, to the knockout is significantly more pronounced at the febrile temperature. So when the parasite gets inside the cell and transports RISA, the body tries to fight it. Uh, so, so the immune system tries to fight it. So if you have, but, but RISA stabilizes the spectral network. And the, the, the connection between the temperature and RISA protein is uh, made null and void when you knock out the RISA protein. And that's exactly what you see here. And uh, so this experiment uh, is repeated uh, conclusively. And that shows the clear role of RISA, but only in the very early stages. Now if you go to, if you do a dynamic experiment, which I'll describe in a minute, I just want to show the result here. If you pass the cell through micro pores and measure the velocity in a quantitative way so that you're doing a dynamic experiment, you can again see normal the, in the wild type, normal physiological temperature, febrile condition, and uh, this is the difference that you see. And there is a noticeable difference because of the elevation of temperature and, and the stiffening. And with increased stiffening, the velocity reduces because it's harder for the cell to go through. Now if you look at RISA knockout, you can hardly see any difference, and the p-value shows that it's an insignificant difference. If you knock the RISA back in by doing the revertent experiment, you capture the wild type trend. So this experiment for dynamic conditions now conclusively shows the potential role of RISA and one protein uh, in modulating uh, the deformability and the physical properties. So next I want to move on to talk about um, um, going from static to dynamic properties. Uh, how do we visualize how red blood cells go through a tiny vasculature in the brain, and how do we know that malaria parasites obstruct blood flow because cerebral malaria is one of the more, most fatal forms of plasmodium falciparum malaria. So how do we know that it actually happens beyond the in vitro measurements? How do we demonstrate it in the lab? So here is the experiment that my student uh, Dave Quinn did a few years ago. So this is exactly the technology used to manufacture computer chips, microfluidic devices. This is made of a polymer called PDMS. And the cross-section here is equivalent to a microvasculature whose inner diameter is three micrometers. Okay? To put the size scales in perspective, three micrometer is approximately one thirtieth of the thickness of the human hair. So that's the scale we are talking about. So what I'm going to show you in this movie is uh, how to, to visualize in vitro in a very crude way 
how red blood cells flow through small blood vessels in the human brain. So this is David's experiments. And you can see it goes from a discocyte to a bullet shape and then it recovers and the characteristic time of relaxation is 300 milliseconds and this is high speed video camera and you can this this one video is full of quantitative information that you can take out of this precisely you can measure the characteristic time of relaxation to be between 250 and 300 milliseconds very accurately out of this so there are a lot of experiments you can a lot of inference you can gain out of this experiment how do we know it works in malaria so what does malaria do uh, to the ability of a red blood cell to navigate through small blood vessels in the human body. Here is the demonstration of that in vitro. So we have a cocktail glass experiment where we have a whole bunch of red blood cells. Intentionally, we have two cells that have been infested with Plasmodium falciparum merozoid. This one, this red blood cell, you can see the parasite here, and this red blood cell, you can see the parasite here. So I postulate that these two cells, because of the presence of the parasite, has, have become so stiff, they have lost their ability to navigate through this two micron cross-section, diam effective diameter cross-section. They won't be able to go through, but all the other red blood cells will be able to go through. So let's see if, if that hypothesis works. So this is a, a collaboration with, uh, with a group at the National University of Singapore. Um, so you can see here, these two cells are not able to move through. And you will see as you put more and more red blood cells ar around here, they can easily squeeze through. So this clearly demonstrates that the stiffness that you measure using nanoscale probe statically have a direct impact on the dynamic response and the flow response of the red blood cells. And uh, these two still are stuck. So suppose you had, instead of two of them, you had 20 of them blocking an entry, would red cells be able to navigate through this? So this also gives you an in vitro, albeit very crude, um, way to visualize at that scale using the latest tools that, uh, that we have. We can go one step further. So can we ask the following question? Can we design a device that's about the size of a thumbnail? It's portable, disposable, and inexpensive, costs no more than 10 US cents a pop. You can carry it to a remote hospital in a developing country, you take a drop of whole blood, you put it into that microfluidic device, and ask the following questions using the microfluidics technology. Does somebody have malaria? Do they have Plasmodium falciparum malaria? Do they have Plasmodium vivax malaria? Do they have temperature because of malaria? Can you calculate parasitemia by filtering out infected cells from uninfected cells quantitatively? So these are all interesting questions. Can you do that with a portable device that's tiny, that you can, very cheap, and you can take anywhere? It turns out it's not as cheap as we would like. It's maybe 10 times more expensive than 10 cents or 20 times more expensive, but the technology is there already. So here is a demonstration of the technology. So let me explain this experiment. This is in collaboration with Professor Jay Hahn at MIT, who's in the electrical engineering department. So we designed. Uh, Hansen Bo, who was a PhD student in electrical engineering, is now a medical student at Johns Hopkins. And uh, Monica Diaz Silva was the French student who's been a post a microbiologist who's been in my lab since 1990, uh, 2005. And Igor Pivkin is a computational math applied mathematician who did the simulations for this. So here are the experiments, three different geometries. We send cells through here through an obstacle course. From the speed with which they move, can you tell whether it's somebody has a malaria or not? And can you do a lot of quantitative assessment in a portable device very inexpensively? So here is the video of that experiment. So you can easily tell which cell is infected, which is uninfected. You can also tell which is ring stage, which is trophozoite stage, which is schizon stage. And different geometries give you different resolutions. That's the beauty of this. Plus, you can control the spacing and shape of this any way you choose. And you can produce it very fairly inexpensively. And we can do whole blood with this as well. So you can filter out different components, and you can separate out using different separation technologies to get an idea quantitatively of what this is. You can do a lot of other things, which currently we do only from a biology vantage point, not from an engineering vantage point. Not that engineering is any superior to current biology techniques, but it gives a different tool. So here is a demonstration of that. So we know 
that plasmodium vivax primarily targets reticulocytes. So these are red blood cells that are typically less than two days old from the time they are released from the bone marrow, whereas plasmodium falciparum can infect any red blood cell. Now, can we tell from this device whether you have reticulocyte or a more mature cell? If you can, you have the opportunity to distinguish between vivax and falciparum. Okay? So here is the demonstration of that. The reticulocytes move much slower than the mature red blood cells. So from the speed, the white ones and the black ones, you can mechanically decide which is a reticulocyte without doing any chemistry. And this is routine. You can do that very easily in a portable device. You can even separate them out. So if you need reticulocytes for experiments, here is another way to do it. It may not be the best way to do it, but it's one way to do it, uh, fairly cheap. Before this, we were getting reticulocytes from Dana-Farber in Boston. And now we, we, could, we could do it in-house. Now let's go to computational simulation. So one of the problems in traditional engineering modeling, where we do finite difference or finite element modeling, we do continuum modeling, which has no length scale. It's too coarse, too smeared out. If you do molecular dynamics modeling, it's too fine. You can do a single cell, but you can't do anything else. You can't do blood flow involving large numbers of blood cells and different components of blood. So how do you do something in between where you can actually simulate blood flow uh, through different uh, vessels. So here, here is a technique called dissipative particle dynamics, which was first proposed in 1993. And in collaboration with um, an NIH-funded colleague at uh, Brown University, uh, Dr. George Karniadakis, we've been working in developing this technique further so we can actually do blood flow visualization, not only for flow, but also for rolling cytoadherence. And we can look at different components of blood. And so we can also look at um, white cells and other, other components of blood. So first I want to show you a controlled experiment done at the University of Washington by Antia et al. in 2008, where they take only red blood cells in a microfluidic device, and uh, some of them contain falciparum parasite. And you will see what happens when the, when the red blood cells in, invaded by malaria parasites go through. You can also see rolling in the in, the in vitro demonstration and you can also see how the cells move. This is the capability of the computational simulation that we have. In fact, uh, we can do much better than this uh, at very high speed in, uh, in a supercomputer. And let me show you what the, uh, this, the level of computational simulation we can do with this. So you can see, how, capture the rolling. You can capture blood flow. And this is only red blood cells. So we've also done it for whole blood with different components. Um, so we can ask a lot of what-if questions based on experiments that we cannot do experimentally alone with this kind of a tool. So this is something that we have used in a, a paper published earlier this year to ask a lot of questions which will be very difficult to do experimentally alone. Um, uh, and, and also the, the, this was developed in a PNAS paper last year. Now how do we go from um, a lab simulation to a system level? So how does the spleen work? What is the pressure differential in the white and red pulp of the spleen? How does the spleen take out uh, a parasite? Uh, we know what the pressure differential is for blood flow, but we don't know for the spleen. So we, we've been working very closely with a group at Institute Pasteur in Paris. It involves a very tightly controlled set of experiments. For example, they receive spleen, uh, live human spleen for, from, uh, for ex patients in Paris for example, pancreatic cancer patients. So there are a lot of ex vivo experiments that you can do. You can infect the spleen with, um, with uh, 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 parasitized red blood cells. And you do controlled experiments. Now, if you measure for different stages, you can also develop a lab simulation. This is the work of Pierre Buffet and co-workers. You can take a two-beat system that actually simulates the human spleen with respect to filtering. So they have refined it to a point where they can capture all the essence of a human spleen with respect to what the beat system does so that you can do controlled experiments in the beat system and calibrate it with a live human spleen. Now what we have done is we have taken our DPD model, calibrated the DPD model with both of these, refined it to a point. Now we can go here to the actual geometry of the human spleen slit and try to see, ask a lot of the fundamental questions that are hitherto unknown and we can close the loop. So this is something that we've been doing for the last three years. 
and there are some very interesting results that are coming out of this. So there is potentially a significant opportunity to go uh, from here to there. And we can not only do this, we can also go to other disease classes, for example, spherocytosis and elliptocytosis, where in one of the preventive measures in spherocytosis is planectomy. So um, in, this, in the very severe case, so those are things we can do now with a level of rigor, quantitative rigor, and a level of sophistication that we could not have done even three or four years ago. So now let me give you a demonstration of sickle cell anemia since we're talking about hereditary blood disorders. This is the work of John Higgins at MGH Hospital along with uh, Sangeeta Bhatti at MIT. This is a fairly large tube uh, in vitro device where you, you have sickle cell blood from a patient in Boston, but then you deoxygenate it, you actually demonstrate occlusion in, in vitro. And uh, so first, uh, this is in the oxygenated state, then you start to deoxygenate, and you see what happens in a minute. The level of quantitative detail we can get out, get out of this is quite substantial and you will see how the vaso occlusion occurs in this case. And you can do it reversibly by putting hydroxyurea and so forth. And you can also do potentially um, assays on the human blood outside the body um, by looking at, so this is what happens when, the, um, um, when, when it's completely deoxygenated. Then so you can look at, explore systematically different therapeutic uh, uh, measures we can also do that at the single cell level using the techniques that I showed you earlier, the obstacle course technique. And this is the work of uh, my postdoc, Sarah Du, and Dr. Ming Dao uh, from MIT. And uh, you see here, uh, this is a sickle cell blood from a patient. And we can do controlled oxygenated, oxygenation, deoxygenation experiments and look at delay times, intervention measures, and, uh, and this, this has the potential to optimize therapeutic treatments in a controlled way. If, if done correctly, but the tools are there. So you can see the demonstration of in-situ sickling, and then you put in oxygen back, and you can measure it systematically. Now I want to take uh, two, I'll close with two examples. I want to take the first example. This is more a fundamental question. We know our red blood cell is a discocyte. It's biconcave in shape. Why did nature make it discocyte? The shape of the red blood cell is the same, whether you are a a bird or an elephant. It doesn't change that much. It changes only slightly. And uh, it's a remarkable mechanical device. Um, so engineers couldn't design it. Uh, why did nature make it discocyte? Obviously to increase the surface to volume ratio. But you can come up with any number of shapes to optimize the surface to volume ratio. Why that particular discocyte? Why eight micrometers by two micrometers? Why that discocyte? So we don't know the full answer. Here is a partial answer thanks to computational biology. So let me describe in a little bit of detail what the computer experiment is. So first we take a sphere. A sphere will not be able to go through microvasculature in the brain. Absolutely no way you can take a five micron or an eight micron sphere as a red blood cell, try to deliver oxygen to the brain tissue. It will not happen. Mechanically it's impossible. So so let's first start with a sphere. A sphere with the same surface area as a healthy erythrocyte. Now, thanks to the power of the computers that we have, this, was, this we did in 2005, so now we can do much better than this, but even in 2005 we could do this. So we take um, a red blood cell, initially a hypothetical spherical shape, but the same surface area as a healthy erythrocyte. Then we take the surface of the sphere and we discretize it into all the spectrum molecules, the alpha, beta molecules that you'll find in a healthy human red blood cell. There are tens of thousands of them. We can put every molecule in, in our model. So all of them are in here. So initially we start with a triangular shape and then we can randomize the shape. We can put in defects so that we make it as realistic as possible so that it looks exactly the same as what a healthy human red blood cell spectrum network looks in the atomic force microscope. Then we give it thermal agitation and vibration, and we put random defects. We get, give it a thermal vibration. Um, so now you will see what happens. So the initial shape now becomes much, much more realistic in the computer. 
Then we do the next experiment. So this is all the molecules in a spectral network. Then we take, do the next experiment. We take this cell, it has the right area but the wrong volume. So we freeze the area, the surface area, keep all of this, keep the thermal, agita thermal agitation uh, for the body temperature, but we slowly reduce the volume by 40%. So now both the surface area and the volume of the cell equal that of the erythrocyte. As we reduce the volume by 40% while keeping the area constant, we look at every component of free energy. What is the free energy penalty to stretch a red blood cell? What is the free energy penalty to maintain a network? What is the free energy penalty for bending or curvature? Because it's a computer model, you can take all the free energy calculations, add them up, then you minimize it. Nature picks something that has minimum free energy, energy minimization. So when you do that, you ask the question, what is the equilibrium shape? So other than the assumptions I described to you, there is no other fudge factor here. So if you do that experiment, a computer experiment, this is what you get. So when you do the energy minimization, the natural free energy state for the red blood cell is what you're going to see because you cannot visualize both sides. I haven't shown the dimple at the bottom. You see only the dimple at the top. And what is remarkable about this is that we know the bending modulus to shear modulus ratio. If that ratio is above a critical value, you'll never get the shape. If it's below a critical value, you'll always get the shape. So echinocytes and all the other shapes that you see can be rationalized as to why nature thought of it that way. You can also relate it to the particular modulus. I say this is only a partial answer, it's not a complete answer, is because I cheated a little bit here. I could have frozen the volume and then changed the area. I did not do it. So this is a result. This is not a unique result. Okay? But, but it, it's very informative on what nature does and how we can potentially interpret it rigorously molecule by molecule in a whole cell. And this can potentially be applied to other cases as well. My last example in the next two or three minutes, I would like to co close with a completely different, different example. So I, I mentioned that uh, we know from the literature for quite some time that red blood cells, when they are invaded by Plasmodium falciparum merozoites, they stiffen, they undergo increased cytoadherence. That causes compromised blood flow and uh, it uh, causes sequestration. Um, and the blood may not be able to go through microvasculature, and this compromises the ability of the cell uh, to, um, uh, uh, to deliver oxygen effectively. So you can ask the question, if increase in modulus, is it always the answer? Can decrease in modulus can have the same effect? I'm not going to show any results. In the last 10 years, there have been a number of papers uh, for leukemia, for, for um, breast cancer, for, for pancreatic cancer with uh, uh, PANC1 cells, for example, that show that there may be there is some connection between changes in elasticity precipitated by chemistry and the ability of the cell to move through. So if the cell can more easily move through, that means it has less stiffness and more deformability, maybe, only maybe, that contributes to metastatic invasions of different types of cancer, including pancreatic cancer. So we showed that for PANC1 cells, and a group in Germany and a group in Texas showed that for breast cancer and other types of cancer. It gives a different perspective. I'm going to show you one example. This is not our work. This is the work from UC Berkeley and UC San Francisco Medical School. And here is the work. This is for leukemia. Uh, one of the necessary uh, interventions for most leukemia is uh, chemotherapy. And while chemotherapy regimen have improved significantly over the last several decades, one of the negative consequences of this is leukostasis, which can be a life-threatening complication in a small segment of those who receive chemotherapy. Um, and this, has, this complication has not improved that much despite, despite advances. So what, what are potential possibilities? We don't know much about this. How, how do we address this? This particular group addressed it the following way. So they gave controlled chemotherapy treatments, and they address one thing that I've been talking about in the context of Plasmodium falciparum malaria, which is mechanical obstruction of blood cells that have been, um, com whose prop physical properties have been compromised by chemotherapy regimen. And what is the consequence of that for, uh, uh, for other possibilities and, and the 
uh, effects of chemotherapy. Here is the experiment. Here are, here are human samples from lymphoid leukemia and myeloid leukemia. Each one is from a different patient. Many experiments, and that's, that's the experimental scatter that you see. So what they measure is in the, the um, yellow ones, um, or the, the red ones are the ones that have been given the standard chemotherapy regimen. The yellow ones are just the cancer cells before the chemotherapy treatment. So you can see the effect of chemotherapy is to destroy the cells, and the stiffness increases about 30 times immediately following chemotherapy. So the cells, by design, become extremely stiff, and that happens for both types of leukemia uh, in all the samples, approximately about 30 times. Now, you do a controlled experiment. So this is what they did, Lamb and Wilbur Lamb and co-workers, and this is my rendition uh, of a paper that, of their results. So this is normal stiffness as a function of chemotherapy exposure time. So once you start giving uh, this particular treatment, um, you, you take the white cells and then you try to do stiffness measurements periodically, and what you find is that this is the standard chemotherapy treatment. Now if you add, without changing anything else, an actin polymerization inhibitor at time zero, when the chemotherapy begins, you get the green curve. So you have no increase in stiffness, and of course this is just one experiment, but the hope is that you, if, if this works, um, you'll potentially get the beneficial effects of chemotherapy without the detrimental effects of leukostasis, if this is correct and if it can be reproduced. Even if you do it after 45 minutes, you see the beneficial effect of this treatment. So that's another interesting consequence. So my last slide is another set of experiments from UCLA Medical School and Department of Biochemistry, the work of Sharon Cross and coworkers. And what they did was they took a pleural effusion, fluid from the pleural cavity, and then they did experiments with a sharp tip atomic force microscope and try to see, try to guess in a blind test whether you have cancer or not. And of course, you do the standard treatments. Uh, you do the antibody labeling, ultrastructural examination, all kinds of things. Uh, but then you also check it with this technique. And in this particular paper that they published, so this is my uh, commentary on their paper in the same issue where their paper appeared. So this is my rendition of, of their experiment. Uh, they, they found correctly in all of the cases compared to antibody labeling, uh, whether it's a benign cell or a malignant cell. And so it's not that one is going to replace the conventional tools with this. This is too coarse at this point. But if you can use one more technique that improves your early detection capability, why not? And the cost of this instrument today for a hospital in a major city is about $60,000. So, so th this, this is, it's in that spirit that this experiment is presented, not because this is the right thing to do, but, but it's, it's one of the potential ways to look at this issue. So, this is, uh, th so these are interesting approaches that come from different angles that can potentially shed significant light on the way in which we look at diseases, perhaps look at diagnostics, therapeutics, or drug efficacy assays, and so forth. So with that, let me conclude with a few observations. First, I hope I have convinced you with enough examples in different cases that there are exciting new possibilities thanks to advances in so many different fields in the last five to 10 years that we have new possibilities for under understanding human diseases at the intersections of traditionally disparate fields. We also have an unusual opportunity to go at size scales and the uh, number of molecules we study in a phenomenal way with existing tools. So, and also to integrate at multi-scale levels. So potential benefits, I gave examples of each one of this. Uh, fundamental mechanistic understanding, of course, for, that's the scientific driver. Diagnostic capabilities, potential diagnostic capabilities with a number of examples. Possible novel therapeutics and drug efficacy assays. Let me just acknowledge my uh, co-workers. Uh, so this is uh, three different continents, uh, this work over the last many years, and it's color-coded very carefully. White refers to people with engineering background or physical sciences background. Underlying names are medical degree holders. 
And the teal color is uh, biologists or physicists from the School of Science. So this is the USA team, mostly in Boston. And uh, this is in Singapore. And this is Institute Pasteur in Paris, where we did some of the experiments. So uh, my, one of my major co-authors in all of this experiment, Dr. Ming Dao, is sitting over there. And uh, he's, um, uh, he's contributed to pretty much all the work. You saw his name on all the slides. And uh, so this is, uh, uh, this is essentially the group that contributed to the work that I presented. Thank you very much. So um, I think probably many of you have questions that you would like to ask Dr. Suresh. So I ask that you go to the microphone, um, and uh, we'll give people a few minutes to um, go on to their next activities first. Um, while, while people are getting themselves together, let me ask a question um, about training. Um, obviously, we're entering an era in which engineering and physical sciences are going to play an increasing role in understanding biological processes. Uh, and we have a lot of um, young people in the audience. Um, should they be looking to cross-train to be expert in both the physical sciences and the biology? Or do you imagine that many of these problems will be solved as we do now using teams of people with different expertise? So I. I started doing this at a very different stage of my career um, uh, than some of the young people may want to do. Um, I, it's, it's always a challenge to go from one field to another, especially fields that are quite separated. And uh, in my case, the challenges were quite different. For example, I was the head of a department. I was head of the material science and engineering department at MIT when I started this. And when you change, when you change uh, the type of work that you do fairly drastically, as I did, you run the risk of making a complete fool of yourself. <laughs> and you, you have to be prepared for that. Uh, so that's one challenge. The other challenge is where do you get funding? How do you get funding before you get your first NIH grant? Because often you need results to prove, especially if you come with no formal training in one particular field, how do you, how do you get there? And so these are significant challenges. And I think it, in a completely different context, uh, one of the challenges that I had as dean of engineering uh, at MIT is um, how do you assess the potential of a young person who is highly interdisciplinary when a more established person writing a reference letter for him or her is not so interdisciplinary? And uh, this is an enormous challenge. So, Quick answer is that I don't know the answer to that question. I think it's very individual. I was extremely fortunate in the sense that I had, I could do some initial experiments with some discretionary funds that I had, demonstrate that what we were trying to do worked. Once I had the results, uh, I was also very fortunate to run into people at Institute Pasteur when they were doing something new and unique that they were excited about. And we had nothing to lose but to collaborate because we were not competing for the same funding source. I was in the U.S., they were in France, and we had, uh, so that was an extraordinarily productive collaboration. Uh, it's a challenge that I worry about at NSF. In fact, uh, just like your uh, director's pioneer program here, we have established something called the INSPIRE program, which we just announced last week. Uh, we announced the first cohort of awards for high-risk um, research, highly interdisciplinary research, uh, an interdisciplinary could mean one person. It doesn't have to be a huge team. Uh, an individual can be highly interdisciplinary. So how do we do this? And we have a lot of uh, internal discussion about how do you identify somebody uh, and select them and fund them for a sufficient period of time so that, uh, so that they have the opportunity to prove. So those are some of the issues uh, that we face. Um, and moving from department to department, there are logistical challenges. I had an appointment in four departments. And uh, how do you go to all the faculty meetings and <laughs> those kinds of things? So. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Suresh, for the, the, this presentation. Uh, I'm not um, sure the microphone is on. Can we get the microphones on? Is on? Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much for the presentation. 
and uh, well to remind us of the importance of need the physical parameters for all the bio medical uh, problems uh, I wanted to ask actually if you have uh, any insight about uh, the role of um, physical parameters in this case membrane curvature membrane stiffness in um, well uh, pretty lower length scales uh, problems like virus entry into cells and especially with respect to vi um, envelope viruses which are uh, well as far as uh, my understanding goes because actually I tried to do something a few years ago which uh, I presented at a biophysical meeting um, well there is quite some variability for instance uh, in uh, influenza viruses uh, of uh, the stiffness and uh, well I've always been wondering if uh, the more um, infective ones would be the the stiff one or the less stiff one and why for instance so it depends on the particular case so if you if you look at the case of uh, an infectious disease like malaria um, stiffness leads to a more pathological state if you look at certain types of cancer, the very initial preliminary results tend to suggest less stiffness leads to a more pathological state in the case of metastatic invasions. So it depends very much on chemistry. It depends on what, what particular issue you are studying. Um, there are a variety of other things that I haven't even touched on. There has been a lot of uh, isolated observations in the literature, but nothing systematic. For example, take diabetes. Um, um, does are there signatures of diabetes that you can with all the, with these uh, accurate probes that you can pick up uh, in a in, in in any cell uh, any one cell and then follow it through through the progression of the disease um, there are even reports in the literature from the medical community if you are a sedentary but healthy adult versus you are a triathlete your red blood cells properties could change if, because of training so there are there are whole range of interesting questions that you can answer. In the case of um, um, diagnostic capabilities, can you take whole blood? And as, as, we, as I demonstrated in one of the videos, uh, can you ask questions about just the state of health, uh, large, uh, and combine it with other tools, uh, lab on a chip, chemical measures, and, and other tools, can you get better at detection than you traditionally do? So there is a whole range of questions and I think this field at this level, even though biomechanics has been around for decades, um, this level of sophistication is relatively new in the last five years. That's what excited me about this field, given my own background. And, and you can prove the nice thing about this is, as I showed in the case of um, uh, the shape evolution, uh, you can take from uh, a persistence length of a polymer or a spectrum molecule to go to shear modulus and then bending modulus from that level to the macroscopic stiffness of a red blood cell and shape. So the, there is a, the, the theory is very advanced, the computations are very powerful, the experiments are very sophisticated. So a lot of these fundamental questions where we don't know the answer, I suspect that in the next, within the next five to 10 years, we'll be getting the answers to them uh, systematically. So um, I have two questions, actually. Uh, one of them was linked to this RISA protein. You showed how uh, going from 37 degrees to 41 degrees, there was a tremendous effect. And so do you have some idea on what's going on? Is there a phase transition, or uh, what's happening with the membrane so, properties? So we, yeah. we have not done that experiment, but um, uh, the work was actually uh, Narla Mohandas at the New York Blood Center published a paper rough on the biochemistry of uh, RISA protein roughly at the same time we published our paper. But unfortunately, we did not systematically control our two experiments in a real coordinated. We found out about our respective work around the time we were submitting our papers at roughly at the same time. So that needs to be done. So I'd, uh, anything beyond the level at which I showed, we don't know the, at the, at the spectrum molecule level. Uh, we don't know the details yet of the biochemistry. And then uh, just out of curiosity, I mean, when you do the molecular dynamic simulation of your computational model of, of, of your blood cell, I'm just curious, what are the other good solutions you get kind of what's, uh, 
uh, what what are other possible shapes you can get out of it like oh that's that's an experiment that that has the computational experiment right. that has not right. been done systematically in fact we've had for the last two years various things we could do we thought we will start with molecular dynamics but later on we decided we'll do a combination of molecular dynamics and dissipative particle dynamics and uh, for example um, going system we know experimentally from a wealth of experimental work over the last several decades that when you go from uh, a healthy discocyte uh, to um, an ellipto el elliptocytosis uh, to ovulocytosis to spherocytosis there is a systematic um, reduction in um, the, the density of the spectral network. You can go from 100% dense spectral network to something as small as 35 to 40% for the spherocytosis. And now the, one of the mechanisms for that is that the red blood cell membrane buds off through the gap in the spectral network, and it just comes off as a, as a vesicle. And uh, we can actually simulate it. One of our former postdocs simulated that process how, of how the vesiculation takes place. So there are a variety of competitive what if questions uh, you can do. But to your point of how does um, molecular structure, in this case spectrin structure, a cytoskeletal structure, affect the shape? And how does the shape affect the mechanical property? The problem is this in calibrating with experiments because the surface to volume ratio changes in the different cases. The spectral network changes. On what basis do you normalize your experiments and compare them is not very clean. And so we can get an answer. Even in the, experiment, in the uh, simulation that I showed you, there are multiple paths to the answer, and we don't have a unique solution yet. So that's where we are. So let's have one more question, and then there's going to be a uh, reception uh, sponsored by the Foundation for Advanced Education and Sciences in the library, and you'll have an opportunity to interact directly with Dr. Suresh. Yes. Well, congratulations for the putting your brilliant engineering mind for the healthcare problems. A short question regarding your last experiment. You suggested that you could inhibit leukostasis by using polymerization inhibitor. So is it reversible? Could you use it in clinical so, practice? So first of all, that was not my experiment. It's the work from uh, UC Berkeley and uh, UC San Francisco. I, I just gave that as one example of a way to use uh, potentially link material science to existing therapeutic uh, treatment, but it's very preliminary, and uh, it, it's uh, you know it, it it's not yet been reproduced uh, independently by other groups, but it's in the published literature. And uh, the interesting thing about that experiment is that not only could you capture it so convincingly by 30 times uh, at a zero time intervention, you can also do it with a delayed intervention. Uh, but beyond that, I think it's something that, uh, that needs to be looked at by other groups, uh, and that has not been done yet. Okay, well, let's thank Dr. Suresh for his stimulating talk. And um, everyone is invited through the reception. We can continue the discussion. Sorry, I went.